in December of 2020. Big Heavy World hosted Art Mosh, a two-day virtual summit of presenters who gathered to help Vermont's creative community survive and recover from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, discussing how they've been affected both financially and creatively. They also share their plans for post-COVID life as an inspiration to others. In this first episode of the six-part series, we hear from Dominic Spillane of Theatre Engine. We at Big Heavy World, as citizens of the United States and the state of Vermont, would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the occupied, unceded, and seized territory of the Abenaki people. And now, please welcome Dominic Spillane. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I am Dominic Spillane. And I'm, the, uh, I'm a theater artist, and I am the founder of Theater Engine, which is an online platform for the performing arts that we are developing uh, right here in Vermont. And um, I am, I'm really grateful to be doing this, to be, uh, to be part of this, because, you know, we're building Theater Engine right now as a tool and as a resource for performing artists. Um, and it's a tool designed to help artists and organizations you know, develop their audience and hopefully also to make some money. So to be able to, you know, talk about that here and get some feedback right when we're about to do a, a big rollout is, is really, uh, really valuable to us. So um, the beta site of Theater Engine it's, uh, is live right now. And, uh, it, but it only showcases some of the features that we've been building. Um, but we are very, very close to rolling out our completed version one of Theater Engine, which includes a lot of the things that we had to completely reimagine because of the pandemic and that we hope will provide some better support to the performing arts community, both now during the pandemic, but also afterwards. So. So yeah, I'd love to tell you about, you know, the choices we made and, uh, you know, hear your questions and get your feedback. You know, I'd love to hear what struggles other people are having and see if there's a way for organizations like Theater Engine or other kind of uh, umbrella arts advocacy organizations can can help out with what individual artists are, are going through on the ground. But um, yeah, first, let me give you a little tour of... Um, what theater engine is so you understand kind of what we're trying to accomplish here so this is what's live right now uh so theater engine the idea with theater engine is that it's sort of a mashup between like fandango imdb and a social network for the performing arts it's a listing site that allows you to post or find the shows that are going on around you but in addition each show is tied into a database that collects and distributes information about the people responsible for those shows which then populates an individual individual artists and company pages so that we can see all of the artists and organizations that make up our performing arts community um so for example right here's this show um but now if i click on this show, this is Green Room Productions. It's happening um, with a group in Montpelier. Um, I'm picking this show because my wife is also actually in it. Uh, but now, because I come down here, I can see that she's in it. I can click over here. That would take me to an artist profile of her own that she can claim and start putting her own promotional material into it. Um, and it has her past shows as well. And it has photos of things that she's done. Um, so that's kind of what's going on at the moment. Um, anyone can create shows, artist pages, or company pages. Um, and eventually we want this to also function as sort of a social or professional network, but those are pieces that we are still building. So here's why, why we're building it, why we're building this, and why we're building it like this. Uh, which I think will give me a, a good chance to kind of tell you sort of, you know, my history and my worldview of what it means to be a performing artist. Um, so I started as an actor. Um, I started as an actor. I was in New York for a while uh, in, in Los Angeles. And um, I think as anybody who uh, has participated as an, as an artist in the world, uh, especially an individual artist, uh, you know how hard it is to sort of build your career. Um, so here's an example, right? So, I'm an artist, I'm an individual artist, and let's say that I do a show, and I kill it. It's great. You see that show, and we don't know each other, and you're like, man, I would love to see that guy in something else. Six months goes by. I'm in a new show at a different theater. How do I let you know? How do I, as an individual artist, build my audience? 
How do you as an audience member follow the performers that you're interested in? And it's, it's really difficult because there isn't really much marketing architecture out there for individual artists. So now let's go up the chain a little bit. Now let's say that you're the theater. So here's what I learned marketing and doing audience development for a theater in New York. So we worked really hard to let people know how great the show was going to be, right? How, uh, we, what the content was, what the show was about, how beautiful our graphics are, right? And yet none of those things were the primary drivers for ticket sales, at least not at the beginning, right? Most initial ticket buyers are buying tickets because they have a relationship with or are fans of someone working on the show. Uh, which is an audience pool that I, as a marketer, have zero connection to or zero control over or, 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 or the ability to measure. My best hope of reaching that audience is to ask everyone who's in the show to do their best outreach on social media, to do all their own marketing and word of mouth, right? To market on our behalf, on the show's behalf. And here's what a little, what's, a, what's a little twisted about that um, is that if I ask you, one of the artists in the show, to post on social media, to get people to come and see the show, and you do, in the end, I I win. Your work is converted into tangible marketing assets that ultimately belong to me, the marketer, not you, the artist. Because I'm the person who's using technology to build a marketing architecture. So at the minimum, you've sent our website traffic that I can use in more targeted advertising, but at best, you've generated a ticket sale, which gives me an email, maybe even a, an address that I can now use forever. But none, of, but none of those marketing assets belong to you, the artist, and those marketing assets are fiercely guarded by the theater, right? So like, try asking the theater for a list of ticket buyers with email addresses after the show. <laughs> You probably won't get it, right? Because uh, it's uh, it's it's very fiercely guarded, and so that's another reason why that that inability to have marketing assets as both an individual artist it it, it hurts it, it hurts you, the artist, because you can't develop your own audience. But it also ultimately is difficult for that theater as well. One of the jokes that we we realize at the theater I used to work for is that. You know, you could always, you could always get younger artists to help you market your show because they would work really hard and they wouldn't realize that all of that energy ultimately belonged to us at the end. Whereas the older artists, they realize that they're going to do all that. They don't have a marketing architecture. So they're just going to be reaching out to their same friends and family. And after the show's over, they're going to go to another theater and that theater is going to ask them to do that all over again. Right. And they're sort of always left out of it. So that's one of the reasons that in our construction of theater engine, we really wanted to boil everything down to the individual artists so that someone, so that you always have some, some agency as well. Uh, now, finally the audience. All right. So um, where does the audience fit into this? So um <laughs> something that's always that I've always struggled with is how educated a consumer you have to be to confidently make a purchase of live theater. So for one, it's hard to find good information about what's going on and uh, where things are happening, right? Like listing sites are generally only hosting the most basic information, um, a description, dates, maybe an image, uh, maybe it lists people in the show. And none of that information is relevant to me unless I already have a relationship with that information. Meanwhile, the show creators themselves are often pushing out all kinds of content to attract their audience. But that's content you'll only see if you're part of their marketing channels. So now I have to be an email subscriber to every theater in town or check their websites individually to know what's going on, right? Like that's a lot of work. And not to mention that many of the best things going on don't start their marketing outreach until a couple of weeks before the show. <laughs> uh, so finally, you know, I have, so, so after all that, I have to buy a ticket, oftentimes a really expensive ticket, maybe two of them, right? One for me and one for my someone else. Uh, and then when I get there, the theater asks me to give them more money because they're not for profit. And still it's a total risk whether or not I'm going to see something that makes my heart grow three sizes bigger or something that, you know, felt like a big waste of my time and energy. So, you know, all of that being said, you know, people jump through these hoops all the time. 
because the work is so worth it. The reward is so, is, 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 is so powerful when you're part of something, you know, fun or exciting or meaningful. Um, but I point that out just the, 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 the difficult that we, the difficulties that we have in terms of, uh, you know, outreach to our audience, uh, the, the, the obstacles that our audience has to go through, um, just to illustrate, um, well, in some ways, why we're building this platform the way, the way that we are. So the idea behind Theater Engine is to create a central place that really makes it easier for audiences to engage with what's going on around them, uh, while exposing more of the information that is likely to be relevant to them. Uh, and finally, allowing them to follow the individual artists, the organizations, or the venues that they are interested in. Um, so we're trying to make the barrier to entry less extreme. Um, which I think is a good segue. Now that I've kind of given you the, uh, the foundation for, for what Theater Engine is and kind of what we're trying to accomplish, uh, it's a good segue to talk about what we're doing now with, with the pan pandemic. So, um, and, and why we're committing so much to, uh, people creating live content online. So I'm going to share my screen one more time to just give you a, a view of what we're building and hoping to roll out very soon. So this is our staging server. This is our staging server. This is not live yet. This is a theater engine stream where we're going to help uh, people create Zoom shows, live streams. Uh, it's going to be a location where people can offer their streams behind a ticketed paywall. Um, and from here, you would be able to see both, uh, live shows when live shows are available again. Um, so you have your live shows, but then you'd also get to see the on-demand shows or the upcoming streaming shows that are available. Um, so the idea still being a portal for audiences to easily navigate all of the many, many things that are going on all the time. Um, now, another addition that we have too is that what's live on the website right now doesn't allow you to engage necessarily um, directly through artists and companies. It's, it, it's all shows. So now we've exposed this as well. So you could say, you know, I'm really interested to see what artists have shows that are upcoming, right? So you can click on this link and see sort shows that are upcoming just, just based on the artists who are in them. Um, or the companies or the venues. And that's, these are things that we can do um, because of how all of our shows are kind of uh, underpinned by this database, this kind of IMDB like database. So that's all, the, so that's all what we're building. We're hoping to roll out soon, but I think sort of more important than what we're offering here is um, why we're offering it. Um, so, despite the overnight collapse of the performing arts industry, I think we have a really exciting opportunity right now. So, you know, when this pandemic first hit, this is the question that I really struggled with the most. Should I do anything different? Should, should Theater Engine do anything different, right? Should I adapt? Should I change? Or should I just wait until this is all over, right? And, and this is not an easy question. I think that everyone who's a part of this is struggling with this question on at some point or another. Um, they're, 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 some, they're at some point in this journey. Um, because adapting and changing takes a lot of time. It, it, it can cost a lot of money. Um, and, and why adapt and change if things are just going to go back to the way that they were? So we ultimately decided that... <laughs> Things are not going to go back to the way that they were and, and that they shouldn't. Um, and this is a hard decision to come to because, you know, building all the, these features out, you know, uh, we're not like Eventbrite. We can't afford to build features that are going to be obsolete in about a year. So we had to really think hard about whether or not performing artists would or should start to committing to making stream, streamable content. Um, and if they would continue to do that after the pandemic. So, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit of why I think that that, that, that we should and, and what I've learned from doing it as well. So up until this point in our history with the internet, 
Live performers have mostly participated online as a marketing channel, right? Um, maybe with the exception of music. Live music, the music industry has a much more developed relationship with the internet and with technology than other performing arts. But still, in general, um, we haven't as a, engaged as aggressively as content creators. And, and this is my theory because it's what's true for me and why I haven't. We generally as a population hate paying for things on the internet. So it's really hard to make money off of making content on the internet. Up until recently, there have only been a few ways to make money as a content creator online. Ad revenue, sponsorships, merchandise sales, um, more recently, Patreon, which is a great new development for making money online. Um, but these revenue streams, you know, they can take a long, long time to, to, to activate, to develop. It can take you years to develop the kind of audience that would make those revenue streams meaningful. As a, as a live performer, um, it, it makes much more sense for me to, um, it makes a lot more sense for me to develop relationships with uh, with venues, right? And with a local audience that's actually going to buy a ticket to my show. Um, and so there have been some platforms that offered live performance behind a paywall um, before the pandemic, but I don't think there's been a significant enough audience interested in buying tickets to a digital performance to make that a meaningful uh, avenue for me as a, as a performing artist, right? So what's different now? The pandemic has done a few things simultaneously, uh, that I think are really important for us to engage with as creatively and as experimentally as possible. One is that it has forced the global performing arts community to learn how to create meaningful digital performances, right? And that's a big deal. We're talking about some of the most creative people in the world are now creating things in a way that they haven't before. This is brand new to the world. The things that are happening right now have never existed before. So that's a really exciting thing that's happening. Two, from the audience perspective, it is completely changing everyone's relationship to what things you pay for on the internet versus things that you don't, right? So that, that's, that audience that might have been small for buying tickets to, uh, to a digital performance, that audience has grown significantly. And, and I don't think just because that's the only option available right now. And I think we're seeing both. I think that in the, the amount of, of live, live performers content that's happening online, we are seeing a lot of content that probably won't happen, probably won't continue when the pandemic is over. But we're seeing also a lot that I think will. Um, and for a couple of, of important reasons. So here, here are a couple personal examples and anecdotes. All right. So, um, my wife and I, um, despite, so uh, outside of theater engine, I'm also a theater artist. My wife and I created a, um, a theater company in uh, Northfield, Vermont called Dirt Road Theater. We just got it off the ground before the pandemic hit. Um, we we're mostly just teaching classes, but um, we're developing an original play. And one of our biggest obstacles to developing this play is um, our geography, right? Uh, what people do we know around us that could help us work on this play? What venues are available for us to workshop this play, to develop this play that might help us, you know, uh, do a performance. Do we have enough money for that? Like these are, these are some of the obstacles we're facing. All of a sudden we realize that because of everyone's n newer understanding with, with zoom and with technology, we can develop this play working with all of the best artists we've ever known in our lives. The venue is the internet. We can do this next week with just sending a few emails. And so, and so we did that. And that was amazing. 
have did we just discover a new more efficient way to develop a piece of a, a piece of art and you know it's not new to the world i know that there are other people who were doing things like that before the pandemic but i wasn't and i don't think any of the other people that we were working with have and are we going to continue doing that in the future absolutely right so that kind of new content creation is huge now we also started doing plays um, with kids, right? So we've been, we, my wife had been doing these classes and writing plays with the kids. Uh, and then we were going to be doing live readings of these, uh, of these plays that they generated, right? Well, now we can't do them live. So we're doing them via Zoom. Um, I don't, I cannot understate how powerful that's turned out to be because these kids shows had we done the reading of this show at the library like we had intended to do, we would have gotten their immediate family and friends and other locals. Now, all of a sudden, these kids and their families can invite their extended family from, from around the country. These are people who would never otherwise have been able to participate um, in these kinds of experiences, right? Um so is that the kind of is that kind of thing something I'm going to continue doing when the pandemic is over? Absolutely, right? Like these are these are this is this is us you know uh uncovering these these gems that we never would have understood stood otherwise. Um we never would have would have seen otherwise. Um another sh another thing that we did. Um so Theater Engine worked with uh, Big Heavy World and Vermont Dance Alliance and Main Street Landing to and with Craig Mitchell to do a series called um, Unfiltered Spirits, where we wanted to uh, sh to to uh, explore what different artists around the state of Vermont were, were up to and were doing. Um, and so we la asked artists to submit if they wanted to be a part of it. Um, and we got a mixed discipline. We had visual artists, uh, musicians, some theater artists. And uh, this was just three weekends in a row. And... Um, where we showcase three artists each week. Uh, and back to earlier talking about, you know, the, the barrier to entry for audiences with performing arts, right? It's, it, there's so much, there are so many obstacles to getting to know the landscape of what, what's out there, what's meaningful that you don't realize, you know, how myopic your own vision has become. So this is a show where all of a sudden I'm getting to see artists that I never would have come across in my, in my natural waking life, right? Visual artists, musicians, and, and all because I had a casual venue to engage with them, right? And that's, that's another asset that a lot of these digital performances are providing is that it's a much more casual way to, to get engaged with these artists so that I can build that relationship. So now when the pandemic's over, it would be, I personally think it would be horrible if we went back to the way things were, right? Because, because these kinds of digital, the ability to engage digitally with these artists, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't diminish my, my willingness to pay a, a ticket price to see that artist live and in person, it only enhances it, right? Before, I was taking a much bigger risk before putting $25 down on a ticket and driving 45 minutes to see a show. Now, I'm, I've been building a relationship with this artist digitally. Am I more likely to buy that ticket now? You bet I am, right? And not only that, but like I've, 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 I've found an engagement to even to, 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 to arts <laughs> uh, that I never would have thought to look into, right? Some of the visual artists that we had on that show, as well as, you know, some of the dance performances and whatnot. So, um, all right. So that's another show that we did. Um, we, uh, I just helped out a show called Two for Zoom, uh, which is the show I actually showed you on Theater Engine, um, which my wife is in. That one we actually sold tickets to. I just want to talk about that one for a second because I, I know that a lot of the digital content that's going out there right now is, is free. And, and what I'm kind of talking about too is the idea of using digital performances behind a ticketed paywall. And I know there's a lot of anxiety about that, right? Like why, you know, we feel almost guilty as live performers to offer something on the internet and should we charge a ticket price because this isn't really like as valuable an experience. And, um, what I have been finding both anecdotally, um, from from other other 
performing artists, but also we I've been finding it with this show and other shows that I've been a part of is that people want to pay a ticket for your performance. Um, it's, it's, it's not actually the, the, the ticket price isn't the more important purchase. The purchase that an audience member makes first is their commitment of their time. That is the most important purchase, right? I have so many ways to spend my time. Uh, by the time I have committed to spend my time with you, the ticket price is is almost is almost the 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 way I can show my gratitude to you, right? So I think we as artists we get very nervous about when to when to ask for money and when not to, um, and I think it's an important thing to to be considerate of all the time. But I do want to say that when we're asking people to engage with us digitally, the 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 their when they make a commitment, the first commitment is, is of their time. Once they've made that commitment, uh, the, the ticket price, as long as it's not extreme, um, is, has, has not diminished the number of participants, if that makes any sense. Right. Cause that's, that's the calculation that, that we're making sometimes, right? Like if it costs money, I'm not going to get as much participants. Uh, if it's free, I'll get, I'll get more because more people will, will casually want to engage. There's no such thing as casually engaging, right? Like, like once you make a, a, a commitment of your time, you're engaged. Um, so give people that opportunity to also support you and to support your work. And they're grateful for it, actually. Um, okay. So then the other thing, something that I, that's actually happening tonight, Lost Nation Theater is doing um, a Christmas carol. Uh, it's a one man show and they're going to be live streaming it. It's the first time they've ever live streamed anything. Uh, they have over 300 registrations for this show. That's probably, and, and, and I think in many cases that's registrations equal devices, right? So you could almost double that number for the amount of people who will actually be watching it. Um, Lost Nation Theater, I, I you know, uh, you couldn't ask for a better audience development mechanism to, 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 to generate that kind of awareness and loyalty to that theater, um, such that, you know, when they have the opportunity to offer live shows again, that's their audience pool has just grown, um, that much more. Um, so, so that, that I, th I think that kind of rounds out sort of what I'm talking about, which is that, um, you know, we're, we're in this opportunity to, to really, um, start to break apart some of that gridlock um, for the barriers to entry for audiences while also disseminating this, this inf this information more uh, about who we are as artists and what we're doing as artists. Um, and, and in a way that hasn't really existed before. And, and, you know, I think, especially while this, while we're still in it, we do have this opportunity to kind of really explore and get better at, at it ourselves. Um, so that, uh, when the pandemic is over, we really know how to hybridize our, our participation as live performers more using, using digital content as a way to, to better grow our audience and potentially also make money with digital content as well. Um, I'm just going to go back in here and look at some, uh, some questions. Um, so, okay. So one of the questions I got was, uh, will streams be in partnership with bricks and mortar theaters? I'm thinking of the tension between film studios and movie theaters because of online premieres for new films. That's a really great question. And this really comes into the gray area of, uh, of, of, this being new to the world, right? Um, and a new aesthetic that's emerging as well, because one of the things that we're, we're seeing is that when live performers are creating filmed or recorded content, they're choosing not to be filmmakers, right? Like what's the difference between being a filmmaker and being a live performer who's making recorded content. And some of that is being, it's all being decided from artist to artist, but some of it 
it's, it's emerging as a different kind of, of aesthetic, which it invites an audience to, it's a little bit more DIY. It's, it's inviting your audience to see, to see the, the, the ropes and levers a little bit more to, uh, to engage their imagination more as opposed to a, a true film film where it's like trying to create reality visually as, as best as possible. Um, but it's still such an, you know, I, I think that, um, in terms of a competition between filmmakers, you know, I think that what you're going to see is that true filmmakers, uh, the film industry has a distribution network that individual theater artists, um, it's so much, so much more decentralized. And, and I think that, that as theater artists and live performers, uh, if, if this as a medium becomes more popular and monetized, I think you'll see both learning from each other. I think that more live performers will become filmmakers in a different way with a new aesthetic of what filmmaking means. And I also wonder if we'll see filmmakers becoming more decentralized and taking on a lot more sort of like live performer aesthetic as well. I think that they're both going to inform each other. Um, I've got a question here that can you explain what Patreon is? So Patreon is, is pretty new. Um, I mean, I don't think it's new, new. I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's probably been around for like, you know, 10 years, but it's, it's like new to most people in some ways. So, um, Patreon is great. It's like, it's like an evolution of Kickstarter, right? The idea of like Kickstarting Indigo, Indiegogo is it's like, I have a project, help me pay for my project. But a lot of artists don't work that way, right? Like I don't work on a project to project basis or I get hired for a project, right? Like, um, the idea with, with Patreon is I'm an artist. Support me as an artist because you believe in me as an artist. Right. It's not, it's not so transactional as, um, as either a ticket sale or a support my project. It's just support me as an artist. And, um, and, and you see all kinds of different, um, content creators making use of this and, and organizations, right? You know, if I'm like a YouTube creator, I can say, um, support me on Patreon if you want to see more content like what I'm making. If I'm a dancer, I can say like, um, you know, support me on Patreon so I can keep dancing. So I think it, it uses a subscription model, um, that usually you might have some, uh, you might have some benefits to, right? Subscribe to me for $5 a month. Then, you know, you'll get the, you'll get inside scoop about things. So you can build those packages the way you want, but it's a really cool, new, um, uh, revenue mechanism for artists because it's allowing you to have a relationship with people who want to support your, your, your work. So Patreon is a really cool new thing. Um, are online performance times of online performance times affected by COVID. So people have longer or shorter attention spans. All right. So I don't have a, I don't have a, I, I have only my observational answer to that. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I was saying about like people making a purchase with their time. The purchase that they're making with their time is almost more important than the purchase they're making with money. However, I also think that there's a relationship to those things as well. I have been finding and observing that um, when something costs a ticket price, you're more likely to have their attention for the whole span of your performance, right? Sometimes with digital content, because the engagement can be so casual, it, it can be really hard to, to get your audience to fully commit to your, um, to your content, right? Especially because we're, we're, we're used to such quick, quickly digestible short form content um online and um something else i've uh, something that we've been experimenting too with like zoom shows uh and zoom performances or recorded shows is this idea of your premiere or show times or what makes something live when it's recorded right like how important is it that it is live and okay so like live versus on demand Right. So we, we, one of the, the Zoom shows we did recently, and I think this is probably an anecdote that's useful to any kind of performer, you know, musicians, uh, which is that, you know, if I'm doing a digital performance, do I record it, put it online and make it on demand for the weekend 
or forever behind a ticketed behind a you know a, a price or not, or do I say I am performing at seven o'clock, and you have to be there or you miss it? In some ways, the like the showtime model is absurd when it comes to the internet, right? Because you're not taking advantage of one of the greatest you know advantages of the internet, which is that people can watch it at their convenience. Um, it makes sense when you're doing a a live in person performance because you know everybody's got to be in the same room at the same time or you're going to miss the performance. However, it it I have been noticing, and you can even see it sometimes in the in the watch logs on something like YouTube. When you say this show is happening at seven o'clock and you have to be there to watch it at seven o'clock, the chances that the people who did show up watched it from the beginning to the end, it's, it's, it's staggering how, how many of those people watched till the end, right? If it's an hour long show, almost all the people who showed up at seven o'clock watched it till eight o'clock. When it's on demand, you do see a, a steeper drop off. Right. Because people be like, ah, oh, well, I can finish watching this later. I'm going to, I'm going to come back to it and watch this later. Do they? Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. So that's, that's an interesting thing. And I, that's, that's really part of that experimental, um, the experimentation that I think we're doing is, is not just how do we deliver the content, but what kind of engagement are we hoping to get from people? And by the way, I do think that has something to do with ticket price as well, you know, because that also kind of, uh, commits people to your content to a slightly deeper level. All right. Um, are there things you can offer that don't happen in person? Watch rehearsals behind the scenes, etc. I'm so glad you asked that question because um, it's kind of like that thing. I wasn't confident enough since this was the first thing that we'd ever done like this. Um, that 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 rehearsal that we or that um, play reading that we did that I, that I mentioned that my the 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 play that my wife is developing developing, um, we we had some awesome people as a part of that. I mean, like you know, people from Los Angeles and New York. You know, some some people who are even somewhat recognizable. You know, and that was just our our, our little Zoom reading. Um, could we have charged a ticket to that Zoom reading? Yeah, probably. Or could we have even just opened it up to the public? Yeah, probably. And, and I think that there's, there's a, there's, um, there's a lot behind that because here's another thing that drives me crazy, right? Is that I, I lamented that $25 ticket price for the audience. And yet we know as artists, we know that that $25 ticket price is not enough, right? Like we're already asking people more than we want them to pay. And yet it's not enough to pay for the show. Uh, and so this idea of more accessible digital content, if that allows us some ability to monetize the development of new work, or to monetize the behind the scenes of artistic creation, or not even to monetize, just to use that, use those things as audience builders, right? Like, you know, it could be totally free, but it's just like, I'm going to set up the camera in the costume shop and you're going to watch this customer make costumes for like an hour. Um, that would be awesome. So a lot of this, yeah, are we, is, is are we getting more? As artists, some of this is just we're getting more familiar with the with the technical components so that we can do more behind the scene content. And and if that can help us to build our audience and and or or monetize these different things so that potentially that helps to subsidize our work more. It also maybe maybe done successfully enough it, it helps the ticket price be less. I don't know, but yes, I do think that there's that um that we should all be thinking more creatively about how we can expose uh, the other parts of the creative process um, in a way that, that this, this, this new digital channel as a content creator could be really, really great for. All right. Um, I've been to many amazing shows. There are going to be new shows that will be live in 2021. Um, let me see. So, so I'm, I'm, if you're here in the chat and you can um, answer my question back to you, I would say, are you talking about, are there going to be live shows like in-person live shows in 2021?
Um, yes, there will be. Um, I would say maybe not until the warmer weather. I have a feeling that when the weather gets warmer, we are going to see an explosion of live performance because even this last summer, I just think, I think there would have been a lot more And there. You notice towards the end, towards August and September, there was more live performance because it took everybody some time to get their stuff together. Right. But it was like, it, this thing happened in March, everybody scrambled, everybody canceled everything. I think, I think all performing artists everywhere right now are, are planning their warm weather summer season. And um, especially with the vaccine, I think on its way, I think, I think the summer is going to be awesome. So yeah, definitely keep your eye out because there's going to be some really cool stuff going on. Um, Hopefully that doesn't create some horrible COVID spike. So be safe. Um, Okay. How can a powerful tool like Theater Engine be used by musicians? Something that singers, producers, etc. can take from Theater Engine to use in their world. Sort of a stronger together ideology. Um, that is a great question. Um, one that we talk about a lot because um, my background was in theater. So I didn't feel confident with the construction of, of uh, this platform in terms of its utility by other mediums. When, when I, when we started and yet, especially being in Vermont, I have learned so much more about the commonalities between the different performing arts, uh, what makes them similar versus what makes them different. And, and it's, it's been really important for us to, uh, to engage with that because um, outside of a major metropolis, you know, like in a New York or a Boston, you can be something, a service that only caters to theater, for example, right? Or to dance or to something like that. But um, when you get out to a place like Vermont, you know, uh, you've got a venue who's doing every kind of performance that there is, right? They're doing theater, they're doing circus, they're doing music, they're doing everything. And so a service that's only useful for their theater shows isn't necessarily as useful. So we've really had to try and figure out how we can be more usable uh, to musicians, to, uh, to comedians, to uh, puppeteers. Right. And that construction has been happening in the background. Um, And, I think our, our next challenge with that, when we have a rollout, I think more of that functionality will be present. In some ways, our, our, our bigger challenge then is, is our identity, right? Like the branding is theater engine. And when, when you look at the content on our site, it's, it's mostly theater oriented. Um, and, um, and, uh, I think, I think it would be, it's a challenge for us to, to let, to try and, and let people identify with theater engine as being sort of like a, this is a place where, you know, almost, almost like a, like the theater as the location, right? The, the venue, but it can be a house, a place for all performing arts because yes, I do think, um, that, that the way we're building it should also be usable for, for musicians and other, and, and, uh, artists of other stripes as well. Um, What are the technical hurdles on the production side at the theater? Um, that's a great question. And I'm really glad that uh, that gives me a chance to articulate something else. Um, we realized that our biggest obstacle to being a platform that exists in the world is that performing artists in general are, 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 have way too much to do, right? Um, they are, Everyone, whether you're a musician or a, you know, a, an actor or a director or a marketer working with a non for profit, everyone's wearing 10 different hats at once. Everyone's struggling to, this is one of the reasons why a lot of the great things that happen, you don't find out about it until a week before because, because the person organizing the event is also directing the event, is also doing the graphic design for the event, is also creating the Facebook event for the event. <laughs> you know, like you've got all of these people who are wearing 15 different hats. And so it's really hard to get people to do another thing. 
Um, and so w- one of the things that we've been exploring a lot with theater engine is, is <sighs> we're asking for you to participate in yet another thing. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe we should be finding the way that we can be supporting you to get your information to a service like ours. How can we be supporting you more? Right. So, so that we're almost looking at it more from like a news media uh, standpoint where, you know, you have the ability to put your content on our site, but also, you know, we can reach out to you as well, almost like a reporter and say like, you know, I might have a relationship with five different theaters and I might just be checking with them all the time to find out the new information they have that's going on. So, so that was something that we landed on. We need to be supporting people more, getting their information out and participating digitally the way that they don't have the bandwidth to do. But if we're going to do that, if we're going to be doing that ourselves, how do we pay for that? How do we pay for ourselves to be that aggressively engaged with the performing arts community? So what we have learned, and this is also another thing I think I said way at the beginning that we're exploring ways to help artists make money as well. And this is something that, that we've discovered, um, that we've discovered that it might be part of this next rollout. And, um, if, if this works out, I would be very, very excited about, uh, excited, which is that, um, we could by uh we have realized that um theater performing arts um it because it's so hyper local i didn't know yes on things like facebook and google ads and digital advertising in general you can do very tight targeted hyper local advertising and yet i didn't i didn't realize that still businesses struggle with with really good meaningful hyper local advertising in general um and because theater engine is so hyper local uh because because performing arts is so hyper local it is actually a very attractive advertising portal for local businesses um not unlike front porch forum front porch forum is really attractive advertising portal for businesses because it's so hyper local right um so one 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 of the other things that we're hoping to to roll out is uh our ability to get local sponsors across the state of vermont to put their ads on theater engine in a way that is displayed on the content pages of the people who are doing shows such that that ad revenue would be shared with those content creators. So if you, if you wanted it to be right, so that when you put a show on, on theater engine, we're actually potentially connecting you to sponsorships as well. Not unlike the kind of sponsorships or ads that you would see in like a digital show program, for example, but anyone who's ever tried to get ads to be a part of a show program before knows how hard it is to that outreach. Right. And that's, that's another one of these disconnects that we've discovered in this industry, which is that it's really hard to do the outreach to find people who want to sponsor your local business that want to sponsor your activity. If I'm a local business, I actually really want to do more of those kinds of sponsorships potentially. But if I did want to, I've got to, I've got to do them individually, one at a time, one over here at Vermont stage, one over here, at higher ground, another one over here at, at, you know, artistry community arts center, right? I have to know all of those different theaters before I buy ads individually. No way. That's just too much work. Right? So we've actually found that there's this, that there's a potential connection point there, a service that we can offer where we're actually giving advertisers, local advertisers, the ability to kind of create a blanket sponsor of sponsorship for performing arts um, in, in a location. So I can, I'm a sponsor. I can sponsor the performing arts activities in Burlington or in uh, the upper Valley. Right. And that, then my ad would display on every single show page taking place in that location. And when that ad is displayed and viewed on those show pages, that money goes to those content creators. Um, 
you know, I didn't talk about that earlier in the pitch just because it's something we're still piloting. We were going to pilot that this summer before the pandemic hit, and then we weren't able to, but we're hoping to get that going as well. But um, not to really geek out on you for a second, but I will tell you that the, the reason I'm excited about that, even though ads on show pages for an internet business sounds really, really, really boring, the reason I'm excited about it is because when you look at the economics of performing arts, is something that the Vermont Arts Council beats a drum about all the time is that the performing arts, the creative economy is an enormous economic driver um, everywhere. And yet oftentimes the, the people, the most left left out of the, of the economic benefits that performing arts are, are creating are the organizations making the art or even worse, the individual artists who are populating that art. Right. And, and that comes back down to that, 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 that ticket, that ticket price, right? It's, it's the point of sale. So it's like, there's, um, there's a performing arts organization. There's a show that's happening in Montpelier, right? That's an economic driver because, because it brings people into the, into the town. Then they spend money at restaurants. They spend money at the stores. They do all these things. It creates awareness. It creates community. It cre- there's all this social capital, economic capital, right? But, but that theater, they, their, their only way to get any piece of that pie is their ticket sale. But the ticket sale hardly even covers their production. So this is where you see this discrepancy between big nonprofits with huge budgets and small, small, you know, artists that are barely scraping by. Because in order to take advantage of the economic whole, you need someone in your organization who knows how to reach back into the econ- back into the community and and siphon more of that money back to your organization right and that comes through donations and that comes through um through grants and other kind of foundational support but but you need someone to do that that's that's someone's job and that's a really really hard job um and and so, and, and if you're if you're a smaller performing arts organization that doesn't have someone to do that membership work, that donation work, that development work, then you have no mechanism to recycle the economic um, the economic benefit back to you, the person who created the economic benefit. So that's a long way of saying that the reason I'm excited about this ads on show pages things is that it potentially represents some mechanism for driving some of that collectively driving some of that economic benefit back into the hands of the content creators. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's my time. Um, yeah, I could go on forever. <laughs> and it, that was great. Thank you so much, Dominic. That was amazing. I do have a couple of takeaways on my own. Uh, earlier you were talking about, um, the, you know, people being online and having a specific time and being engaged. Well, I have a quick story. I, so I'm a huge Garth Brooks fan. Everyone knows I'm a huge Prince fan, believe, believe it or not. I'm a Garth Brooks like. And so there was one night at the beginning of the pandemic that him and Trisha were going to do requests only from his basement called Studio G. So in the, in the con- comment section or the questionnaire chat room, you know, put your, your requests in. Now, before this all started, I made myself a nice meal. I put on my Garth Brooks, you know, concert t-shirt. He can't see me, but I'm having my own little concert in my living room. <laughs> and I'm posting like, play this song, play this song, play this song. Um, we shall be free. They never played it. Oh, well. Now I'm noticing no one else is requesting that song. Well, a few days later, CBS television announced, well, because of the huge hit of the basement show, we're going to do it live on CBS. So I'm like, oh. Great. Another chance to maybe do this. So they went live in their basement before they went on the air. And I'm going, you know, we shall be free. We shall be free. We shall be free over and over again. No one else requests it. So it finally goes live on television. And there's Garth. And he's playing his guitar with, with Trisha. And then the credits roll for the beginning. And he goes, okay, before I get started, and then started into We Shall Be Free, did a verse. And of course, he goes to that one fan out there. There you go. You got your song. And I was like, yes. Now, it may or may not have been me. But because he, there was some engagement there prior to, it made me feel like he was speaking directly to me. But I made an event out of that event. Um, so I was willing to be engaged. And there was no financial side to that, just the fact that I was a fan. Um, also, I, I love the fact that you brought up um, the sort of marriage of all the different um, 
philosophies of of what it means to be a performer, from a singer to an actor to a director, et cetera, uh, and a dancer. And, and that's what we kind of did with Unfiltered Spirits together. And it reminds me a little bit of, at least that's what I'm thinking of right now, um, the uh, American Utopia, I think it is. It's the David Byrne film that Spike Lee directed that was an art piece. It was musical. It was dance. It was all those things smashed together. So I thought that was a great um great piece that you of, of what you were talking about in your section of your, your uh, presentation so thank you so much thank you for ha- having me uh i hope that that i put some coherent statements together um you definitely did <laughs> without a doubt and again but just a reminder to everyone that this is being recorded um we are going to be using this to replay to educate and uh folks from the state will be looking at this to hopefully make uh, things better for us as performing artists in the future when this all happens again. So uh, we're going to take a two or three minute break. Uh, let the next presenter who is DJ Lou get set up and ready. And I'm going to grab something to drink and then uh, we'll get started with uh, the next hour. Dominic, feel free to stick around. Uh, otherwise, thank you so, so very much, Dominic. Thank you. Thank you.